Hello, everyone. And good afternoon. Thank you for joining me today for Sundays at Home, a time for conversation and discovering more about the women who have helped shape our world, but have been largely underrepresented in our historical narrative. My name is Emma Rothberg, and I'm the Associate Educator of Digital Learning and Innovation here at the National Women's History Museum, and I will be your host today. The National Women's History Museum exists to preserve, illuminate, and share the powerful history of women in America, highlighting both the past and present. NWHM seeks to ensure that women's history is available and accessible to learners of all ages across the globe. Our guests are available to answer your questions, so please use the Q&A feature on the tool ribbon to ask any questions that you may regarding the presentation. You may submit your questions at any time, and we will leave time to answer them at the end. Elsie Robinson may be the most influential newspaper columnist you've never heard of. A nationally syndicated columnist whose column ran for over 30 years and had 50 million readers, Robinson was a pioneer woman of unflagging determination. Journalist Alison Gilbert, who is with us today, and author Julia Shears has written Listen World to tell the story of this timeless maverick. In telling Robinson's story, Gilbert and Shears have also tackled the obstacles and rewards of telling women's stories. It is this latter topic that we want to focus on today with our two special guests, Alison Gilbert and Laura Mazur. Laura Mazur is a literary agent who specializes in adult nonfiction with a focus on women's issues and women's history. Before joining Wendy Sherman Associates, Laura was executive editor of Seal Press, an imprint of the Hachette Book Group, where she edited bold voices in adult nonfiction. Before joining the book publishing industry, Laura was managing editor of the global news agency Creator Syndicate, representing some of the most influential opinion writers and editorial cartoonists of the day. A longtime advocate for underrepresented voices, Laura sits on the board of the Op-Ed Project and teaches publishing workshops for Bold Voice Collaborative. Alison Gilbert is an award-winning journalist and co-author of Listen World, How the Intrepid Elsie Robinson Became America's Most Read Woman, the first biography of William Randolph Hearst's highest paid woman writer. The New York Times raves, quote, one does not tire of spending time with Elsie Robinson. And Susan Orlean proclaims the biography, quote, the rarest of things, a lively piece of unknown history, a marvelous story of a woman's triumph and a tremendous read. Allison is also the author of three books on grief and loss, past and present, always too soon, and parentless parents. Learn more at alisongilbert.com and connect with her everywhere using at a Gilbert writer. I'm so looking forward to this conversation. Please join me in welcoming Allison and Laura to the screen. Hello. Hi. So we're just waiting for Allison to join us here in a second. Sorry. No, there we go. All right. I'm here. I'm here. We're so looking forward to this. Welcome, ladies. Thanks, Thanks for, for having us. For having us. This is so fun. Emma, thank you very much for the introduction. And Allison, I'm so happy we are here today doing this. What everyone here doesn't know is that we've been waiting four or five years for this to happen because from the minute you begin a book publishing project to the time it comes out in the world, it's a very long wait. It feels like um, immediate gratification is not part of the portrait here. How does it feel after all these years of being the only one who you and of course, um, you and Julia to be the only ones who are really um, knew deeply and um, in, intimately about Elsie and now everyone can learn about her. Is that a, finally like a very satisfying moment? Yeah, Laura Mazur, thank you so much for joining us today. What a complete treat to see you and have you be a part of this. We're gonna get to how you have been so intimately involved with Elsie's story in a moment, I am sure. But yes, I feel like I've been pregnant for a really long time and I feel so good to finally give birth and to share Elsie Robinson with the world. I feel like she's been this great secret. Um, I have loved learning about her and reading her inspiring words. And I just, I'm so grateful to finally um, have her story be available. How frustrating was it for you through all those years of research 
travel, making phone calls, doing the reporting it takes to find the actual meat of the story that was buried under layers of history. How frustrating was it for you to talk to people and say, Elsie Robinson, and I have them say, who? That was a common refrain. Uh, Elsie Robinson, who was something I heard from not only uh, archivists and librarians, but also surprisingly, most journalism historians. And that was once both exciting uh, to be on unchartered terrain, but also at least initially quite alarming because you're like, well, Elsie Robinson was real. I have evidence. How is it possible with such a long history? You know, she became William Randolph Hearst's highest paid woman writer. She was the most read columnist in the country during her time with uh, Emma had talked about 50 million readers and that is, you know, at its most conservatively, conservatively we could say 20 million because that was what was in Hearst's domain, but mm. Hearst also syndicated Hearst content in other newspapers. So that's where that 50 million number comes from. So she had America's attention as a columnist and it was just alarming and exciting that no one knew her name. It makes me wonder if today, or maybe in 30, 50, 70 years, the name Ann Landers will be lost to history. Is that possible? We don't have a crowd of people to say, raise your hand if you've heard of Ann Landers. Um, I don't know if you know this, Allison, but back in the day, uh, in the 1990s, when Ann Landers was still with us, I was her editor for a few years. I know. I didn't and know that. I, I know. And even though I spent all that time with Ann Landers, or Epi, as she was called, because her name was Esther Pauline, not Ann, um, even then I didn't know who Elsie was. And that is just a marvel to me, because Elsie was the precursor to Ann Landers. She, Ann Landers also was in you know, 300 newspapers, millions of followers. She had a whole empire based on this column she created, but the presentation of her to the world was the first one, but she clearly was not the first one. Uh, Elsie came before her. And the, here's, I'm getting to the question. This is what I wanna know, I'm so interested. Elsie was very bold. She said all kinds of things that were shocking today, let alone then, but back then the kinds of messages she was offering women were so profoundly liberated. And fast forward a generation or two or three and we get to Ann Landers and she had to be very careful about what she said and how she said it. Because if she put something in her column that was controversial, certainly she would stand by her own words, but I know that she um, was like very judicious about every word she chose and how she said what and when she said it for fear that the backlash wouldn't be worth it. I'm wondering if you can tell me a little bit about Elsie putting these stories out into the world, these messages for women to do something different than what the world has told them to do. And was there a backlash for her? Well, there's so many things I want to address. Number one, and most kind of fun, is that Ann Landers referenced past Elsie Robinson columns in her work. And Julia Shears and I found examples of that, and uh, we included them in Listen World. So that's just, you know, a fun aside. But I think that Elsie really was emboldened. Uh, when she was hired by William Randolph Hearst in 1924, she was known as somewhat of a unicorn. And what I mean by that is it was very rare that writers also drew their own editorial cartoons. And because she was a double threat, because she was not only a writer who wrote a column, but because she also illustrated her columns, I think that she felt pretty secure and her voice when she went to bat for what she wanted internally, more pay, the ability to work remotely, you know, something that we take for granted or it's more much more common today. But back in 1940, she wanted to have more time at home to then double down on side projects, her side hustles, um, which I think elevated her 
in the Hearst media empire, and so she wasn't very timid at all. She was in fact just the opposite. She was bold, she was empowered. She actually could teach a master class, Laura, in getting what you want from work from your employer, because not only did she demand what she was worth, she then offered evidence and proof of her scholarship, of her audience, and how she was bringing more and more subscribers into the Hearst universe. It did, though. It, that, that's so true, Allison. She was able to recognize her own value and stand by what she wanted from her team, essentially. I would say that her bosses, and they were her bosses, but ultimately she was making them money. So at a certain level, that hierarchy shifts. You're not, oh, thank you for giving me a chance to say some words to the world. Her as her prominence rose, I can only imagine that the Hearst empire became more and more um, um, deferential to her. I know that when Ann Landers would call the office, everyone dropped everything <laughs> on the phone. She would call and say, it's Chicago. That's all she'd say. And everyone knew what that meant. Uh, we dropped everything because when you are the most widely published columnist in the world, that means you're bringing in the most money in the world from that sector. And so you have to honor that person for what they're doing for you. Okay, so all of that groundwork laid, it did take Elsie quite a while to wake up to the idea that maybe she can ask for more, ask for different, rearrange, right? She needed some help at some point and find it. She really literally had to have some kind of um, a breakdown. I think it's fair to call, is that fair to call her that? Before she could go and say, I, I need a little more help here. How modern woman is that? Yeah, I think that she suffered what we would characterize today in our words of like not really embracing the, the work-life balance. She didn't really understand what we would call today as self-care. She was on a gerbil wheel. She was in that rat race. She was clawing her way to the top. And once she got there, she kept treading water. I mean, she kept wanting to keep her neck above to stay in her position. She came from nothing. She had no contact. She was dirt poor. In fact, before she got to land uh, in the William Randolph Hearst Empire, she had to work in a gold mine for three years, 600 feet below the surface of the earth, just to make ends meet for her and her chronically ill son. And so why I mention her background is that when you work that hard to achieve, once you get there, you want to stick you are not going to sacrifice anything to go back. And I feel like she didn't have the breathing room she felt to give herself a pause and her health 100% suffered because of it. She considered taking her own life. She had a nervous breakdown in her words. She had a crack up uh, and I don't wanna make light of that it was serious she was hospitalized she was taken uh from her home once uh to the hospital um and these are very serious conditions that i think we can relate to somewhat today even though the vocabulary as she would have described it is so different and it wasn't just for her that she had to work hard she had a son for her son by the by the time her well we don't want to give away too much of the story by the time her son left for college uh she was already fairly well established, but all of those years beforehand, every day was another scramble to get enough money to pay for food and shelter, find a good place to live, make the best choices for both of them. Uh, I think that's something that can resonate with women today too. That's why we need these stories, Allison. That's why we need to have these stories of women from history that have been lost to us. And we need people like you to go back and be the archivist, dig underground and pull out these stories for us and then tell them you and Julia Shears did such a beautiful job of resurrecting Elsie's story, her impact, her place in history. It, it's, it's easy to assume that if he she were had been a man, she either would not have been lost to history or she, he, he, she as he would have been a, more of a household name. Of course, we don't know that. We don't have a reverse crystal ball to know exactly what would have happened in that if scenario. But um, 
here we get into this issue of book publishing and um, how it gets tricky when we publish books of a people no one's ever heard of, man or woman, that's the case. But in, it, as it happens in history, it, we tend to have heard of the men. We tend to have not heard of the women. Ergo, we publish all these great books about men because that name recognition factor is what sells books. And we have to sell books in order to earn back the investment of making the book. So I get all that, but what do we do about this double-edged sword if we need the women's stories too, but if we haven't heard of them, how do we sell them? It's tricky. Well, I want to give a shout out actually to our host today, the National Women's History Museum, because they did an exhaustive study that we actually cite in Listen World, our biography of Elsie Robinson. And what the museum found is this, that in American public schools, kindergarten through 12th grade, when you look at what gets taught in social studies classrooms, again, K-12, of all the historical figures that are taught, 24% are women. And so if you're not taught about women's history, you can't actually learn about women's history. And then perhaps your interest and your excitement can't be ignited to then write a school report about a woman from history or let alone a book. But my question is for you, Laura Mazur. Here's the fun thing that our audience will now learn. But the main reason, the primary awesome reason why I wanted to do this event with you today is that while today you are a fantastic literary agent with Wendy Sherman, when you and I got to know Elsie together, you were executive editor at Seal Press and you acquired my book. This book Julia Shears and I wanted to put forward at Seal Press. So let me toss it to you to say, why did you take a shot on Elsie Robinson's story, given that she wasn't a household name? How did you get this to go through the channels at Seal Press to acquire the book? And by the way, thank you. <laughs> oh, entirely my pleasure. Believe me, I loved doing it. Uh, you're right, though, it was tricky. Um, I believed in Elsie the way you believe in Elsie. Um, I have a, an affection for the newspaper industry, which in this era has faded away to a different kind of population, but I'm still of the generation that got up every morning and read the paper and on Sundays spent hours pouring through all the pages because that's where we got the best content information, news, lifestyle, culture, politics, it was all in those pages. So I have a great affection for that entire industry. And as it evolved, I was drawn to Elsie. I was, I knew Julia Shears and Alison Gilbert could write a gorgeous book. The only thing holding me back or making me a little bit, you know, antsy on pins and needles about bringing it forward with the publishing group was no one had ever heard of her. And as we know, there is um, an assumption in the publishing world that if you've not heard of somebody, no one's gonna wanna buy the book. There are some loopholes to that though. And that's what I really tried to wrangle and leverage to get this book greenlit. So for the people here, I don't know if uh, our audience knows what it takes to get a green light to make a book happen. Essentially, when an editor is considering a book to, if in the vernacular publishing, put on the list or to acquire or to buy it. These are all words that say, hi, author, I would like to make you an offer and give you an advance and you're going to give me a book and we're going to publish it together and we'll have a contract. If an editor likes a project and wants to buy it or acquire it, they can't just decide. It's not a one person decision. They have to bring it to an editorial board and make a presentation. So you have to put the book on an agenda Tuesday at three and you send advanced material around to everybody in that on that board and hope they read it. <laughs> and the day comes and you go into the room and you make your pitch. And in that room is obviously the boss, the publisher. There's publicity and marketing, sales reps, foreign rights, production, design, everybody who will have a hand in making that book a success is in that room. Oh, it's a little unnerving sometimes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You either love it or you don't, but um, 
in that room, you make your, the editor makes a pitch. And then after that, the editor doesn't do a lot of talking other than answering questions. The Laura, I have a question. How much time do you have? Like when you're making that pitch, how much, how much floor time do you get? When I, after I've sent my material around the book proposal, a cover letter, my thoughts beforehand to everybody who's going to be at the meeting. When I walk into that room to pitch it, I've only got a couple minutes because the whole project only has maybe 10 minutes for conversation. Of course, if we need more time, we can put it on another agenda, but we try to get through these because there are going to be other books to talk about. Maybe the editor down the row has two books and someone else has three. We have to be able to talk about lots of books in that one meeting. So it's a very quick window of time. And it's uh, no nonsense, let's talk about it. And the bottom line is if we spend money to make this book, can we expect to earn that back in sales? It's every book has to be considered a potential for either breaking even or making a profit. That's the hope, that's obvious. So um, I knew that walking into that room, the, um, the expectation was that they would say, Elsie Robinson, I've never heard of her. Readers have never heard of her. Why would we publish this? And that's when I get to that little loophole that I was talking about before. If you can contextualize a person as the best, the most, the person who stopped World War II, who cracked the code, who cured cancer, there has to be one thing that that person did that no one else ever did that changed the way we live today. And that was a little hard to make an argument for, for Elsie. I believe it, you believe it. We know it to be true that what Elsie did for women and commentary and having a source of information about how we live and how to change the way we live to better fit women um, is absolutely substantial. But making that case to a room full of people where I couldn't say she cracked the code that ended World War II. She didn't cure cancer. She wasn't the first woman to reach California. I didn't have something like that. So I had to play with the language to try to contextualize it that way. And I think what we ended up with something similar to what you have in the subtitle, to be the most red woman in the world, that's pretty substantial. Um, and the other thing that we did is we went through the book proposal that explained to everybody in the, on that board what the book would be about. And every famous person's name, we put it in bold. Do you remember that? Who else did she know who is famous? Who else did she know who is famous? Because if the book itself is peppered with people that we do know who they were, Hearst, of course, was a big name. Certainly, we have many biographies of him. The more that makes a case for Elsie to be the centerpiece of the book, because people might show up for the other names they do recognize. It was many years ago that I had that meeting in that boardroom. I remember bits and pieces of it, but not the takeaway of um, exactly how confident the room was that this is a book that they would sell, but they did see the value and they did buy this, um, they did uh, buy into the vision that if we can create a portrait of this woman as a lens for a wider story also, that maybe by attacking it from both directions, one, Elsie knew a lot of people and she was influential. And she represents a certain place and time that people are excited to hear about, intersection with this topics like poverty, journalism, writing, independence, single motherhood. These are topics that are really pertinent today. So all of that added up. I made a case. Hurrah. I got to play it and I got to come back to you and make an offer. And I was thrilled. No one was more thrilled than Julia and me. So we are still, you know, benefiting from your incredible efforts that day in that meeting room. So thank you so much. But you know, it's so interesting when you mention about telling her story through the more um, famous names that she encountered and she was in touch with. Interestingly enough, as researchers and writers of biography, that came into play doing the digging about her life. There was no Elsie Robinson archive. You know, sometimes when you're doing a research paper or some deep digging into a book, there might be an archive to go explore at a museum or at a library or an institution where all the papers are housed under one umbrella. There was no such archive for Elsie Robinson. And so we had to go through the men who employed her.
So within the William Randolph Hearst archive, there was correspondence that other researchers didn't care about between Elsie Robinson directly to William Randolph Hearst and his replies directly back to her, demanding her top placement in his papers for her reporting. So it wasn't just columns. She actually was dispatched to cover breaking news as well. But also Arthur Brisbane, who was one of his incredible deputies at the New York Journal, his archives at Syracuse University. And in there, again, through the men who she worked for, there were treasure troves of information about this incredible woman. And I think that kind of um, is a great example of what it's like to research women sometimes. You can't just go to the Elsie Robinson archive. It doesn't exist. You have to go through the men and figure out who the men were and do a backwards approach. And the one other complicating factor that I think may interest folks who are joining us today and who may be watching this recording in the future, another challenge of researching women is their ever evolving names when they choose to get married or when they do get divorced. So it wasn't just that we can look up the Elsie Robinson byline, which of course we did, but she also wrote for a time under her married name. She wrote for a time with initials from her maiden name and her married name. We have so many iterations of how women uh, use their names over the course of their lifetimes for so many women. And that became a research challenge because you never really knew when you had found everything that was associated with one woman, one human being. And of course, Elsie made headlines too, not just as the writer, but as the topic, because as you wrote in the book, when she and her husband began the process of having a divorce, which was very rare then, that actually made national newspapers that these two people were getting a divorce. So here she is in this scandalous story, very tabloid-esque, don't you think? Well, you know, today, whether or not it's a good thing or a bad thing, it just is. When you get separated, when you get divorced, it is not the scandal that it once was. It was such a scandal. Elsie left her husband in 1912. And back then, many women women would rather be known as a widow sure. than to admit that they that, were actually divorced. There was sure. a scandal um, about it. And so for her to have this sense of wanting this bigger, richer life, that no matter the scandal that would ensue, that she was going to go for it and not feel suffocated by the strict confines of her life, of domesticity, of motherhood, of only being focused on child rearing. All those things were important to her, but they weren't the only things that were important to her. She wanted to be creative. She wanted to pursue travel. She wanted to see the world and she wanted to experience all there was equal to men. Why should men see the world? And she needed to stay home in her words, I'm paraphrasing, but that's where she came from. So my question back to you, Laura, is yes, how challenging is it for you now as a literary agent? You've switched roles. You are no longer on the receiving end of book proposals. Now you are the giver of book proposals as an agent. When you're looking to acquire authors into your stable, are you looking for women's stories? Are they more challenging or less challenging now to sell into um, book publishers? I don't think anything has changed, Allison. I think we are still in uh, a, um, a an environment, a cultural environment, where people want to buy things they know something about. So if I hear of an Elsie Robinson type person that I find fascinating, that I think is an important subject for a book, I still need to be pragmatic and think, if I have this writer go to do the due diligence of putting work into creating a substantial book proposal with sample chapters and every, it's a lot of work, as you know, it's a lot of work. Yeah. And if I'm going to do this substantial work of taking it out to publishing houses and editors, am I wasting everyone's time or can I really envision getting this across someone else's 
green light finish line and their editorial boardrooms. I want to champion all of them, but I also have to champion books that I can sell. And on the behalf for the author, for me, that's how we make a living. So um, one of the things that it makes that comes into that decision of who do we push forward and take a risk on? Who do we take um, that extra effort and put the, our sh a shoulder into it and, and make it really um, as incontrovertible a decision as possible is something we haven't talked about yet. And I think we should. Okay. Um, LLC has been praised in low these last half hour and all this time that we've been talking about her for her gumption, her chutzpah, her bold confidence, her willingness to do things that are not just difficult and backbreaking literally, but also no one else was doing them um, in her gender was her and a lot of men. She was afraid, she was hungry, she was, um, she had a spunk and a spirit that fueled her in a way that is so incredibly inspiring. And for all of these reasons and a hundred more, we can understand why we wanted to read her. But the thing that we haven't talked about yet is, oh my goodness, she was a gorgeous writer. What a beautiful writer. It all goes back to that, that the words she can put on a page. And she came to it from some natural place because even her early writing, when she was first noodling around and uh, whether it's with children's books, the reporting, the columns she wrote, the or even her own journals, the words she chose, her diction, her language, her rhythm, her energy of, that she put into the writing, uh, you can't pay for that in an MFA program. She just came to it intuitively. And what a gift. Do you have any sense of how she came upon that gift so innately? You know, she has characterized her love of reading, which of course leads to, as we all know, better writing from when she was a young girl. You know, she grew up, she was born in the late 1800s. She was born in 1883 uh, and she read she was a voracious reader and you know i'm a mom and i was always told raising my kids that the more you read to your child uh the better vocabulary they'll have the better writers that they will be and reading was always encouraged in the elsie robinson household and i think too her writing skills got sharper out of desperation laura I, her son was chronically ill his entire life. And so just to entertain him, he was born at the turn of the 20th century, just to keep him laughing in the face of real fatigue, relentless fatigue, she would draw stories and write him incredible stories of whimsical characters. And I think she exercised these muscles for herself and for her son but then she realized she really did have something there. And I feel like that's a great lesson for all of us. It's like, what are we good at? How can we then reverse it and show it to the world? How can we take what we're already passionate about, subject matters that we care about, that we know we have ownership of in a way that maybe others don't. And that's how she started. She was writing and illustrating for her son, amassing this incredible mini archive of her own work. And when she got her first job at the Oakland Tribune in 1918, it was the work she did for her, for her son, for her child primarily, that she showed that editor and said, give me a shot. You don't have a children's section. I will run one. I will create one for you. And so I feel like we can look to ourselves and our own passions and our own talents and decide what should we make public facing that we can really run with. Well, that's such a nice idea. Elsie is inspiring in so many ways, whether it's as a single mother, as a person who works hard and is not afraid to give the elbow grease to whatever she's putting her heart into. But she was good at so much of it. I'm dying to ask you one more question. I don't want to interrupt you. I don't want you to leave and pivot and come back to me because I have one more question for you if you don't. Okay. Mind. So we were talking about selling nonfiction about women. And I'm wondering in your literary agency now at Wendy Sherman and perhaps more broadly across the sphere, not just your agency, is it easier to sell fiction 
about women or historical fiction about women? Is there a dividing line between nonfiction and, and fiction, do you think? I, I think, oh, sure, absolutely. No, unquestionably. Uh, I, I think that had this been written as a novelized depiction of an Elsie Robinson, and had it been written in the shape of a novel, like a really good, quick paced, beautiful, rollicking, frolicking novel, uh, that is something that would be less of a challenge for a publishing team to say, can we sell this? Because a gorgeous, beautiful, intense, meaningful novel about a woman's life, the highs, the lows, the heartbreak, the motherhood, the career, that we see all the time being successful. When we switch over to the nonfiction side, people read those stories. Um, they come to it for, from a different lens. They tend to not come to it for the storytelling. It just so happens that this book happens to be a beautiful piece of storytelling. It really is rich in detail. It evokes a certain place and time. The pace, I couldn't put it down. Uh, I, I just read the whole thing in one sitting. But um, that doesn't, it doesn't translate into the same kind of sales necessarily than we see as something that's put on a fiction shelf and marketed as just an incredible story and then possibly a movie. We should have a movie of Elsie. Oh, yes. Who's listening? Who wants to do that? We a movie of Elsie. What a story. She what had a story. daughter of a slave. A freed slave was the woman who gave her a typewriter and said, I need this back, but you can go learn how to use this. And that is also speaking of things that are pertinent to today. Elsie had to master technology if she wanted to join the newspaper industry. She's working in the mines. She's exhausted. She knows I cannot be in the mines forever. This is going to end. It's going to end because that mine's going to end and because I can't tolerate this kind of backbreaking work for the rest of my life. That's absurd. What am I going to do? I would like to make a living as a writer, but this thing happened where you needed a typewriter. And I remember the era when suddenly we switched from typewriters to computers and then from modems to the internet. And there's this idea we always have to keep learning new technologies, but we don't think about that in terms of that time. And what a fascinating tidbit to learn that Elsie said, I have to go from using my cute little pretty tidy handwriting and I have to type this now or sure. I'm out. Yeah, and we found that typewriter. Uh, we Amazing. went to, or one that we thought is 99.9% .9 certain it was hers. We went to the ghost town, uh, which is really now very sparsely populated, but back when she was working in the mines from 1915 to 1918, she was gifted this Smith Premier typewriter. It had a, an entire keyboard for capital letters and another entire keyboard just for lowercase letters because the shift key wasn't even invented yet. And we found it in a padlocked post office because the woman who gave it to her, the daughter of that former slave that you were just mentioning, um, she had access to an ancient typewriter. And then we worked with typewriter experts who could date that typewriter for us. And without knowing for 100%, with 100% certainty that it was Elsie's, it was Elsie's. And we put the photographs of that typewriter in the book. But you're right, she had to learn the touch system. She had no idea how to type. She put, you know, she covered her eyes and was trying to figure out the touch system to submit those manuscripts and she did it by candlelight uh you know in her miner's cabin you know after she put her son to bed and so we can all relate to multitasking too and not wanting to only do the work that pays your bills not only doing the work that keeps your child fed but doing the work that fills your heart yeah yeah. Oh, she's just an incredible woman. I'm so happy you brought her story forward for us. I'm so happy I get to be a part of the story by giving it an opportunity to be published. And um, I, I think it's such a beautiful book, speaking to the history of California, to the history of the United States, to the history of our class system, um, 
to all these topics we've been talking about, but also to the experience of being a writer. Because as uh, any writers in this room will know that it is hard, it is hard to invest in yourself to put the words on the page, knowing they may never be read by anyone else. At the moment that you're writing them, so often you're doing it on the on spec, which is what she had to do in the beginning, on spec. And she didn't do it by having someone else pay her bills while she ruminated and let the muses come to her. And she didn't go draft after draft. She didn't have the luxury for any of that. She worked all day making money to take care of her child, get him medicine, feed him. And then she worked all night by candlelight, writing what she could write that she hoped she could sell. And um, I just, I really honor that hard work. Not, I don't know that I would have the stamina or fortitude to do that back bringing work, physical labor all day. I don't even know, think I would have the stamina to do not back breaking physical labor all day and then work all night on something else, but she did it. I try to remember she was young. We're a little older than she was at the time. She was young, she had energy, but still that's commitment. And that is, um, and thank goodness she did because those beautiful words that she writes, they, whether it's poetry, parenting, women's issues, politics, whatever she wrote, she just, she was able to tap into the right well of words, the right rhythm, the right style. And that is a, that's a gift for any writer. I think to be that flexible in your voice and style it does not come naturally for 99.9% .9 of us. I think that the challenge that Julia and I faced in writing a biography about such a beautiful writer, and I agree with what you've just said, is that we knew that readers were likely not going to access her 1934 memoir. They weren't going to find on their own her 9,000, you know, essays and columns and articles that she wrote. And so our challenge was how to take her writing that is in fact so beautiful and in some ways better writing than we could offer. You know, sometimes Elsie just said it better than Julie and I could ever. And so you will find when you read Listen World, Elsie's voice is on every page or nearly every page. And we showcase her with those sections in italics. So even if it's two sentences or maybe it's three paragraphs, if we felt that Elsie's lived experience was best expressed through the woman who actually lived them, then we wanted to give her the floor. We gave her the microphone. We deferred to her own voice so she could explain what she was seeing, what she was living, what she was hearing. And we felt that was the best way to share Elsie Robinson's story. Did that read well for you, Laura? Because I don't think in our proposal we had figured out that structure quite as well as we did upon execution of the final manuscript. It did, it, I thought it was beautiful. It did work very well. I enjoyed those pieces where we had vo Elsie's voice come in. I relished them. There's a delicate balance between doing it so much that it starts to take on an academic sensibility. If, if you had the those excerpts from her own writing and her own voice peppering every page or long stretches, it would start to feel like you and, um, and Julia as the authors we're really just reconstructing things that she'd said to create a story out of her words. That's not what you did. You wrote the story of her life, but you allowed her to speak up for herself here and there just enough to infuse the manuscript, the book, with her, um, with her voice, her sensibility, the language of the day. I loved some of her expressions. What a joy. Um, and it does remind me quite a bit, speaking of fiction, you asked earlier about would it be easier to sell this as fiction. Let's talk for a minute about Kristen Hanna's book, uh, The Four Winds. Oh, okay. The Four Winds is a best-selling novel about a young woman with little few prospects who marries somebody that she wishes she hadn't and ultimately has to make the right choices for herself, for her child, for their health, for their ability to feed themselves. And she goes West and becomes a writer. That is a very, very, very pared down 
narrative to describe yeah. what happens yeah. in Kristen Hannah's book. But it is absolutely, to my mind, a testament to this kind of a story told as a novel is a much easier way forward to reach an audience so often than putting it in this biographical context. It could just be that people read more fiction than biography. I probably do as a consumer. I would probably like, oh, I, I have a, a, you know time to read a book. I think I'll go get a novel. M more likely than let me go get a biography of somebody I've never heard of. That's hard. This is what we've been talking about low this last hour. But um, but her story is the stuff of novels. It is the stuff of a cinematic drama that is not to be believed except it is true. It is. I want to ask you a burning question that I think would likely be on many people's minds listening to you right now, Laura. It's rare, I think, to hear directly from a literary agent what you feel hits the sweet spot in the market these days and how you like to be contacted. So like, what is the format that it's a query letter? What is a query letter? If someone has an idea for a woman in history, whether a novel or nonfiction or something else, but here we are with the National Women's History Museum. So let's assume that it is a female protagonist. You know, how do um, expectant, hopeful, eager writers uh, reach out to literary agents, not just you particular, but like, sure. you know, what is the first step? Yeah, well, this is another one where there's a divide between fiction and nonfiction. If you are writing a novel, you have to write the whole thing, all the words, all 80,000 some odd words of your novel have to be done and polished. You might have some readers, you might have an independent editor, it gives it, it has to be done and ready you have to feel almost as though this is ready to publish before you reach out to an agent. For nonfiction books, it's a little easier. Uh, the idea is that you have to do a book proposal. In that book proposal, you are describing what the book will be about, how it will be structured, why it's important, and how you as the author are the authority who should be the one writing this particular book. Right. So a lot of people, I had a great idea about a book about X. That's wonderful. You had a great idea about it, but are you the right one to write it? If somebody had a great, if I had a great idea in a book about Zen fly fishing, that's terrific. Good for me for having a great idea, but I don't know anything about Zen fly fishing. I'm not the authority on Zen or fly fishing, let alone both. So I'm not the one to pitch the book. So they have to create this book proposal, making a case for themselves as the author, making a case for the book itself and including three sample chapters or two, two can be okay too. So those are the things that hopeful aspiring writers, authors, published authors are offering to literary agents. And typically there's a submission, uh, there's a submission queue you send your manuscript and query or your book proposal and query through. For us, it's on our agency website. Most agencies have that submission guidelines posted right on their website. And then it trickles into a, an email inbox, very sophisticated. And then the proposals that are meant for me, as opposed to the other agents in my agency, they land in my inbox eventually, and then I can review them. And, um, and then I have an opportunity to reach out to the writer and say, either I'm, I'm curious, I'm interested, I'd like to talk and hear more, or perhaps I'm not the right agent for this. One thing I will say to all the aspiring writers who are in this querying process, and it's so unnerving, and I'm so sorry, you're sending out your blood, sweat, tears, and hard work out to agents. And so often you hear nothing back or you hear no's. And I want it to be really, I want everyone to hear that 99% of the time it's for a reason other than the caliber of your caliber of your work. It could be because the agent's not taking new clients. It could be because um, they already have something similar. It could be because your topic, your area of expertise is not the agent's. Somebody sent me a great book about Zen fly fishing. I wouldn't know what to do with it. And I would say, I wish you all the best, but I, I don't know how to sell Zen fly fishing because it's not my field. So there are a lot of these, like almost, it's not quite like beat reporting where you have your desk and that's it and you cover your topic and that's all. It is a little wider and agents do take on a wider set of categories than just one or two. Often they'll publish lots or represent a lot. 
Um, but uh, for all of the writers who are in the querying process, reaching out to agents and hoping to make the magic and that match with one person, keep going because it really is a matchmaking process. It is tricky. It can take a while, but when you do make that match, it's such a beautiful thing. Well said. Well said. I wanted to add to that, but before I add to that, I want to pause. I want to pivot. I want to go back to Emma to make sure we haven't missed any questions in the chat because um, I do want to make sure that we're answering questions in rapid fire. Um, but if there are no questions, I do have something in reserve for Laura. So Emma, do we miss any questions? Yeah, so this has been um, such a wonderful conversation and we do have a couple of questions that have come into the chat or to the Q&A, I should say. So the first one really is just, how did each of you learn about Elsie? I learned about it from Allison. Allison brought Elsie to me. Allison, tell us the story about how you stumbled upon Elsie. Yeah, this is actually part of what I wanted to say before, um, which leads to this question beautifully. So Emma, thank you for that. But Laura, something you said before, as someone who's been so hungry to write a book, something about what you said landed for me and it made me, it made my palms sweat and it made my throat tight and I could feel the tension that some writers would feel when you say something like, are you the expert? Why you? And if you're not the person who is expert on fly fishing, then stay away from that book. This story of how I found out about Elsie might lower the blood pressure a little bit because I am not a historian who writes only about journalists. So I didn't have a similar kind of platform. I mean, I am a journalist, but I'm not a historian. So you might say, well, then what was my leverage to tell Elsie Robinson's story? So mine's a little bit different. I think this kind of works in that way that Laura was describing, but just in a very different way. I don't know, Laura, if you would agree, but I only found out about Elsie Robinson because my mom died. Um, my brother and I went back to our childhood home to clean out my mother's belongings and inside one of my mother's books fell a piece of onion skin paper. Remember that onion skin paper that's so thin? She had retyped a poem that was called Pain, P-A-I-N, and it was the most tough love poem about grief and loss. Basically, the words were, be lucky you had a mother worth missing kind of like snap out of it, like that moonstruck moment. And it was attributed to someone named Elsie Robinson. And I had no idea who she was. And that's what set me on the course of writing this book. And then eventually coming across Julia Shears as my amazing collaborator. And I could not have done this book without her. So together we made this book happen. But I feel like that could be an equally important story, Laura. I don't know if you would agree because I'm not an academic and so I couldn't sell myself in that way in terms of why me telling the Elsie Robinson story. Do you do you know what I'm talking about? It's so interesting we said oh, you're not an academic and we struggle with this in the publishing industry because to write a biography, it does help to have some sort of academic underpinnings you can point to and say, oh, I did my study, my PhD in this or I wrote about that. But we don't want academics in trade publishing. Not we don't not want them in trade publishing. We want we don't want academic writing for the general everyday consumer. Those books that we're writing, like Listen World, we didn't want it to read like an academic wrote it, and it should have been published with a university press. It's a different style of writing. So we get a little stuck. Who can we get to write books that are biographies that read like brilliant stories, like real storytelling? but you still have the authority. So the idea that you can be an authority on something, I'll start with this. You, you don't have to know everything about something to know enough to substantiate your own value and what you bring to the project. So no, you are not a history of journalism expert, but you are a journalist. You and Julie are both beautiful writers. You had both shown that you can write about stories from a previous era and the you had both had books go out in the world before that did well. So yeah. that was a lot of evidence to a publishing team that you were reliable, that you were capable, you had the chops to tell a great story, that you had the investigative um, skill 
to figure out how to find out what age a typewriter came from, most people wouldn't know how to do that. Like, I love that we found, we, we found a typewriter specialist who told us what the age, how old the typewriter was, that's what you have to do. And if you don't know how to do those things, writing a story like this is impossible. Yeah. You did have that. And so you were an expert. Thank you. I, I, I hear everything that you just said and I, I'm taking it all in and I, I appreciate that very much. Emma, do we have time for one more question? Yeah, so um, we did, we've got like two more questions uh, that I want to make sure that I ask. So um, I know that we're at time, but these are really good ones. Uh, so Matthew was wondering um, if you could describe how Elsie's columns reflected her political beliefs, beliefs, sorry, political beliefs. Well, it's very interesting. I'll just sum it up really, really quickly. Uh, she was a feminist. She believed in gender equality, but she would never have identified her as a feminist. She would never have identified herself as a feminist. Back in her day, that was akin to being a man hater, and she was not going to be considered a man hater. So her progressive views um, about women, about salary equality, you know, job, workplace equality in the home about how women should be able to pursue, you know, pursue their own sense of fulfillment. All of those were progressive and completely feminist. And so she would talk about those topics. She would express herself beautifully in her columns um, and double down by presenting some of these thoughts in her editorial cartoons. And you could see, by the way, many of them, we created a timeline on the lcrobinson.com website, and we put together a virtual gallery. And you could see some of her greatest editorial cartoons there. And so I encourage you to check that out. Thank you so much uh, for that answer. I was just gonna look for the uh, lcrobinson.com so I could uh, drop it in the chat for everyone. Um, and while I am doing that, just as a last question to both of you, you've been talking about how um, empowering and impactful Elsie's story was to each of you and how there are so many resonances between her life and you know, contemporary conversations. So for each of you, what is the biggest takeaway mm. from Elsie's life? I, for me, I'll answer first while you noodle, Allison. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll be your uh, opening act. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I can't help but think that Elsie is um, the poster child for being willing to take risks to push against what the world wants you to be so you can become what you are meant to become. It is very easy to believe what the world is telling us we are, we can do, we deserve to do. And she broke all of that down and said, uh, I'm gonna go another way. And what, one of the, we were just talking a minute ago about, um, she was pretty, she was charming, she was lovely. If she had wanted to pass in that lovely, genteel world, she could have. She was set up to be able to immerse in the high class and she had the lovely demeanor and she carried her clothes well and she could do all that, but she chose another way and what a brave act to say everyone is telling me i should and could and must live my life this way but i'm going another direction no matter what you think of me and that's that's exciting I love that. And I would go in a slightly different direction. My takeaway, Emma, and I thank you for this last question, is that Elsie was not someone who waited. She didn't wait for the door to be cracked open for her. She kicked it down. Uh, even when there was no obvious path forward, she managed to create the work she managed to create the opportunity there was no children's section at the oakland tribune when she went into that editor's office with examples of her work she said let's make one let's do it and here i will do it for you um and i feel like she kept doing that uh by offering her talents but then showcasing them so other people would then say you know what you've knocked on this door and i will open it but it was her who did the knocking. No one came to her and rang the doorbell. You know, I think she could teach a class 
about going after your dreams and just not letting your feet stay planted long by walking, by charging ahead, by running ahead for what you want. Well, thank you both for those answers. I mean, those are really great messages, I think, to kind of leave our audience with and, and you know, to kind of sum up Elsie's life. And I mean, I want to thank both of you um, for bringing me to, to the attention of Elsie. I mean, I, I'd never, I was one of those people who had never heard of Elsie Robinson. So um, just, you know, hearing about her and the, the struggles that, you know, to get her life story published in a way that she kind of mirrors what she had to go through in the early 20th century. It's, it's inspiring, it's empowering, and, you know, it makes me just kind of want to learn more. So thank you both uh, for, for talking with us today and for sharing Emma, your story. Yeah. I'm just going to say one thing about the National Women's History Museum, just really quick. There is a biography on your website about Elsie Robinson uh, that's been crafted. And so if you are listening, if you are watching this recording now or in the future, go to the National Women's History Museum website, find the Elsie Robinson biography. Um, I think you'll be inspired and um, I'm so grateful for your support, really. I'm just so thankful. Well, thank you for the shout out, Allison, and thank you all again for joining us here this afternoon. It is our great pleasure to spend Sunday afternoons in conversation with inspiring guests like Laura and Allison and our museum community. If you enjoyed today's program, then please mark October 16th on your calendars for a virtual tour of the nation's capital. This guided experience led by a tour of her own will explore historical sites and stories central to women's political engagement and feminist movements throughout American history. And the event like today starts at 3 p.m. For a full listing of our upcoming programs that bio on Elsie Robinson and for registration information, please visit the public programs and events tab at www.womenshistory.org. All events are free, but advanced registration is required. So Allison, Laura, again, thank you so much for spending uh, your part of your Saturday with us and our museum community today. It was wonderful to hear about uh, both of your processes, both of your fields and Elsie. Um, and to everyone, until next time, please stay safe and healthy and happy Sunday. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.